guys to my dearly departed grandmother, you know, so you have to kind of pick this the soft spot somewhere in the mid-range and try and find a starting point where you assume people's knowledge base is. Same kind of issue with a talk like this. I normally do talks, libraries full of kids and so forth, and you know, starting down here with the space program, because a lot of them will still ask questions like, so when did we land men on Mars? How long has it been since we did that? And you gotta explain. It was the moon, it was a really long time ago when you're probably before your daddy was, was alive. So, um, so it makes for an interesting challenge. But what I wa thought I'd do is uh, try and come up with some, some things that maybe some of you haven't seen or heard about with regard to the space program. I find I've been making documentaries about space for about 25 years and writing books for about 10. And I still find stuff all the time that I didn't know that just amazes me, some of the things I discovered that, that these people pulled off over the years. So I thought I'd do the usual you know, ever since the beginning of time when man first looked at the skies, you've all heard it a thousand times. The only reason I want to cover this was, A, this is how the book starts off, and B, I think it's kind of interesting, when you look at Mars through the, through the millennia, when I try and picture living in the past, before there were street lights and shopping malls and all that kind of thing, even in these smaller villages, there weren't that many campfires burning after six or seven o'clock at night, because when it got dark, people went to bed, because there wasn't much left to do, right? So it's very dark. You guys have been out and seen stars in the sky when it's dark. Most people younger than 30 haven't seen much of that, because it's hard to get. I live in Los Angeles, and I have to drive to Death Valley to get the skies now, which is very sad. But back in those days, you looked up in the sky, you saw that one unwinking star that was red. It was the color of blood, which is kind of remarkable, and that got people very interested. And then. Every now and then did that kind of weird S motion in the sky that didn't make any sense over the course of a couple of days, a couple of weeks. So Mars is always an object of fascination, but it's interesting how it evolves over time. I'm skipping a couple of seminal cultures here for time's sake, but, but starting with the Egyptians, Mars was known as either Horus the Red or Hard Assure, depending on which epoch you're looking at. And you know, always I think because of this red color, he's associated with war and strife and conflict and grief. With the Egyptians, he was kind of a, somewhere between a nuisance and a bad afternoon, you know? Even though he was involved, and it changes every few couple hundred years, they, they kind of change exactly how they deal with, with Mars. But he's also the protector of the harvest and things like this, so Mars was a great multi-purpose god for those guys. Then you come along to the Greeks. I think they're the most interesting. They call them Ares, of course. And Ares is not the brightest guy. You know, uh, he's the son of Zeus, so dad, of course, had the brains. But um, Ares is violent, temperamental, petty, childish. So rather than being the guy you want to lead a charge against the Spartans or something, he's really more of the guy that comes to the picnic and eats the tops off all the cupcakes and, you know, kicks over the table or something. He's just a real irritation. But then you get up to the, uh, you know, the Romans here. And now Mars is the guy, you know. He's now named Mars, god of war, the god of conquest. He's their man, you know. He's, he's their will I am, I guess, or something like that. So he's the man of the hour. The Romans are extremely, as you know, extremely violent and conquest oriented. And so Mars becomes a major figure. And that kind of lasts a long time. You get in the Middle Ages, and they're beginning to think more of these things in astrological terms than gods and goddesses. And now certain planets are associated with different bodily functions and temperaments and things like that. So, of course, because Mars has been perceived with war all these years, Mars has to do with temperament and uh, your liver, I think it is, you know, the, the state of certain organs that make you grumpy, that kind of thing. Um, oh, that's the wrong button. Excuse me. I just got a new remote control. And there we go. Okay. Now I picked this picture of Galileo because we've all seen all the other ones. But it's the first one I ever saw that has him with his telescope, because I never knew how big that thing was. We always see pictures of the telescope sitting by itself and it looks about this big. Well it's not. It was a fairly large instrument. It was in the 1400s. As you know, Galileo wasn't the first guy to use a telescope, but he was the first to make profound observations that became part of the scientific literature at the time, as much as he was able to do it before he got persecuted by the church. 
So he made early observations. This is really when Mars becomes a place. You know, it became clear this wasn't a star, this wasn't a red star. This was a, a thing not that far from Earth, a planet. That's a very optimistic representation of what he was able to see through that telescope. For those of you that have seen Mars through a telescope, it's wonderful because you know it's a planet and it's out there, but compared to Saturn or Jupiter or something, Mars is really kind of a disappointment because even through a big telescope, I used to work up at Griffith Park. We had a 12-inch refractor up there made in Germany in the 30s. It's a wonderful instrument. And Mars is a little red blob that wavers around because the air is so crummy in Los Angeles. Anyway, we'll assume that he saw something vaguely like that. So it was enough, like I said, to move it into being a place as opposed to a concept. And 400 years later, here comes Giovanni Scaparelli, who set good science back about 100 years. Um, <laughs> very smart guy, devoted observer, amazingly devoted observer. I mean, he, he spent you know, almost as many hours as Percival Lowell staring at Mars, drawing all these wonderful maps and charts. There's a lot of pictures of him out there, too, but I thought the one with the stamp was the coolest because it had all this other stuff involved with it. So as you know, Scaparelli made extensive sketches and kept lots of notes and began seeing, as some other people had, these lines across Mars. Interestingly, nobody ever saw the same set of, of lines. So what do you do? Well, you observe it over the course of a few months during opposition and hope that you get some kind of average that gives you something. So Scaparelli starts keeping track of all these things, making these fantastic maps. He was the one that formalized using Latin names for the Martian features tried to anyway, and then made the very unfortunate choice of calling them canali, which of course means channels in Italian. To the western ear, what does that sound like? Something far more organized. Here's one of his best maps. Um, you saw that little red dot, right? His telescope was a lot bigger, it was better, but nobody sees this when they look through a telescope at Mars. You have to backfill it with your mind, okay? So he, he made these extensive maps and got people very excited. The idea that, that canal eye or canals were made by intelligent beings took ro root sort of slowly. Scaparelli didn't really promote that. Early on, he was sort of wishy-washy about it. Well, you know, if you ask me, they could be, but I'm not really committing one way or the other. Now, a lot of people wondered, scientists, smart people, about what this observation of canals was over this 100-year period or so. And one of, the, one of my favorite theories is that they were using uncoated optics in their eyepiece. If you've ever used an uncoated eyepiece, you know it's highly reflective. And because of the brilliant light of Mars coming through the eyepiece, they were seeing the shadows of the capillaries inside their eye. Now, when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's really interesting, but I don't buy it. But then I found this. This is a map of capillaries in the eye, and that's one of Scaparelli or Lowell's uh, Mars maps. So, you know, if you squint a little bit, maybe. Or maybe it was their imagination. You know, the human mind has a way of wanting to make form and logic out of everything, which is why some car grills look like faces and things like that. So it could be a lot of things, but I thought this was a very compelling argument. Well, here comes Percival Lowell, son of a wealthy family in Boston. They made their fortune in textiles. Um, he went to Harvard, got a degree in math, not astronomy. So he was technically an amateur astronomer, and he's always referred to in the history books as an amateur astronomer. But when you go to Harvard for math, you're no dummy, right? So he's amateur quotes only. He spent his younger adult years in Japan and Asia writing books, studying the culture. He was actually sort of an unofficial attache to the United States government for a time there. So he was a really fascinating guy. But he came back to the US, obviously read one of Chaparelli's books, got very excited, and more than anybody else probably said, oh, canals. Canal Let's see, that means intelligence, that means design, that means engineering and government and all this kind of thing. So he started writing some books that I'm sure you all know about. Um, that's his telescope at Lowell, which I always think is fascinating, especially the car wheels down there that actually let the thing turn. But you got a big heavy wooden dome, you got to figure out something. Anyway, that was the instrument used exclusively for Mars for a long time. Also discovered Pluto with it in 39, Clive mm -hmm. Tombaugh. So he wrote these books. Bestsellers of their day, he was kind of the Tom Clancy or the Simon Winchester of his time, I suppose. Um, between 1895 and 1905, he wrote, I think, four, four or five books. Um, on the right is a little bit of his, his reasoning. 
And if you've never read them, they're kind of interesting. Now, this is Victorian, post-Victorian writing, so you know, it takes four pages to just describe the wallpaper of the room before you get out of the business of talking about science. And this guy loves words, so I've been accused of putting purple prose in my books. Well, he makes me look like a total amateur. I mean, it's just words after words, all 19 syllables long. But what's interesting is, as far off the base as he was, you can follow his logic and say, you know, if I was in that situation and all I had was that telescope, I'd probably think the same thing. He came to some very well-reasoned and fascinating conclusions. Unfortunately, they included a global government because you'd have to have a global government mm -hmm. to do this massive engineering feat all over the planet. Canals taking water from the melting poles of water ice, which actually we've sort of come back to after many, many decades. 